Mrs. Lane. What do you want to do tonight? Same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. Hey guys, we're excited to announce that the You Are Creators podcast is brought to you by GoDaddy. GoDaddy is an awesome site where you can find the right name for your business. Hundreds of new domain names are available now, including .photography, .estate, and .guru. Create your website with GoDaddy's easy-to-use website builder. Even run your business anytime, anywhere with Microsoft 365 from GoDaddy. Visit GoDaddy.com and enter promo code CREATOR28 to save 28% on your order. Some limitations apply. See website for details. This is Justin and Erica from You Are Creators, and we have a special guest, Reverend Lionel Fanthorpe. Welcome, Lionel. Thank you. It's an honor to be on your show. Okay, so just to give the listeners a little background on who Lionel Fanthorpe is, Lionel is quite an accomplished man, to say the least. So we'll try to touch on a little bit of his background. Um, he's an author, a journalist, a priest, and a teacher. He's also a popular TV and radio presenter. Mr. Fanthorpe has over has authored over 250 books and has been deemed the greatest storyteller of our time. He, along with his wife of 57 years, have also co-authored several books together. Mr. Fanthorpe is the president of several organizations. He holds many certifications and degrees. And here at You Are Creators, we call him one of the most interesting men in the world. Thank you so much for being here with us today. May I say again, it's a very real pleasure and it's a genuine honor to be on your show. Thank you very much for inviting me. No, thank you. Let's get started, Lionel. Okay. Okay. Based on all your research... What have you found out about human potentiality? Can we manipulate matter with our minds? I believe that we can. I, I think that if we look at thought as a form of energy, and this particular theory will go across to various uh, aspects of paranormal investigation, but if we think simply of light, heat, electrical power, any form of energy known to the scientists, and we then say to ourselves, if we regard thought as one of these forms of energy, then we should be able, to, once we've learned how to control it in the best possible way, to optimize our control over it, then we should be able to do quite miraculous things. One example that I'd use is that when you're in a situation that requires, let's say, more than your normal output of energy or strength, and you can concentrate on it, you can really will that thing to happen, it's as though a sense of power comes to you from somewhere else. Now, I think that the somewhere else is the depth of our own human minds. If thought is a form of energy, and if we can utilize that energy, if we can direct it, then practically nothing is impossible. And right. if we look at those examples where... Um, you know, when I was in the army, I served in a regiment called the Cambridgeshire and Huntington Light Infantry, and I was the battalion rock climbing instructor. And there are moments when you're rock climbing on a, a very difficult rock face that you have to call on something that you don't use in normal everyday life, and it will get you to a hold that you didn't think you could reach. Uh, same thing with my martial arts interests. If you're in a difficult situation with a big, powerful, skillful opponent, and you're just about equally matched, then if you are determined to win, if you put all your strength and energy into beating that opponent, then you seem to get additional power from somewhere. And my suspicion is that it comes from inside the mind. Now, I also think that if we could use a, a basic physical analogy and regard the power center of the mind as 
something like the cellar of a house. And when we're in our normal conscious state, we live in the, the living area of the house. But when we want to do something unusual, important, we go down into the cellar where all the electric fuses are and where the gas taps are and where all the, the main water valves are. And then we can make something happen. Now, the cellar is the subconscious. That is where all the trigger mechanisms are for using the power of thought. And we get down into that subconscious area when we are particularly emotionally aroused in a, let's say, a martial arts situation or a, a rock climbing situation or if you are called on to do something that's enormously important but is beyond your normal conscious physical strength and suddenly you find there's a great surge of strength from somewhere and my suggestion is that the mind has switched it on you've gone down into the, the cellar the emotional subconscious and there you've pulled one of the main levers it's only a theory but I think there's a lot in it. Interesting. Okay, so do you actually think that there are psychics or clairvoyants, and can we all do this? Ah, no. I think that what we refer to as clairvoyance, or in the case of some psychics, clairaudience, because there are there are people who can hear things, or they claim to be able to hear things from another realm, another dimension, from the spirit world. And... Mm -hmm. My feeling there is that just as if we took a dozen people at random to help us with an experiment and we asked them if they would look at a colored picture or if they would look at certain distant objects, we would find that statistically there were those who had below average color vision and below average distance vision and then we'd find those who had above average very very clear color vision and very clear distance vision now those things would seem to be in that physical sense part of our physical makeup you know the shape of the eye and the hyperacuity of the optic nerve would account for the differences. Now, if we think about the psychic medium who claims that he or she is able to hear things and to see things from another realm, from another psychic dimension, I think that the possibility is that in the mind, in the physical brain of that man or woman, there are differences, there are abilities that Mr. and Ms. Average don't have, and that it may be possible to develop those psychic facilities just as we can develop muscle by going down to the gym, or just like we can improve our golf swing by getting out on the course and practicing. And the same right. with our tennis strokes. So that I think that psychic ability is a difference in the mind, just like long or short-sightedness in the eye. And I also believe it can be cultivated, that we can improve it. Okay. So, do you believe that life continues after death? Oh, yes. I'm as certain as one can be in a speculative area of that kind. Um, may I give you an example of what convinced me? Yes, please. I, I had a very good friend called Billy Farrow, and Bill and I were young teachers together in Cambridge. We both worked at the same village college. And we were as close as brothers. We thought the world of each other. We'd do anything for each other. And all the time that we worked together, we had that very happy relationship. You knew you could rely on your pal. If you had a problem, he'd be there. And then 
after I'd moved to Cardiff and uh, trained as a priest, I got a phone call from Billy, uh, who had then just recently retired, so he was then in his 60s, in the late 60s, and he said that he had just been diagnosed with a terminal illness and that the doctor told him he had three months at the most. Would I go over and see him? So, of course, I did. I went over as often as I could, bearing in mind I had to work as well during the day, and it's a 300-mile drive. And then I got a phone call from his friend, Ian, who was his village priest. And he said, Lionel, I'm very sorry to tell you, Billy has died. And one of his last requests was for me to go over to uh, Cambridgeshire and conduct the funeral service. So I said, yes, of course I will. So he said, as it's a long drive, come on over the night before. We'll get the service ready together, and we'll do it fairly early in the morning. So I drove over and uh, got to Father Ian's vicarage, and we sat there. If you can imagine the scene, two priests with two prayer books looking at the funeral service and saying, well, if I do this prayer, you do that one. I'll do this reading, you do that one. And then quite suddenly, I saw Billy. I do not normally see anyone from the next world. I don't see ghosts. I don't hear ghosts. I'm very pragmatic, practical sort of guy, both feet on the ground. But I saw him as clearly as if he was another human being. He didn't look ethereal, didn't look like a phantom. He just looked as he'd always looked, but 30 years younger, in his prime, smiling all over his face, radiantly happy, and no sign of the illness. And he said to me quite clearly, just like listening to another human being speaking to you in the same room, he said, Lionel, tell Ian that Lady Juliana of Norwich was absolutely right. And then he went. And I hesitated for a moment. I'd only just met Ian, other than talking to him on the phone. I thought, he's going to think I'm coming off the wall. If I say, oh, by the way, I've just seen Billy, and he asked me to give you a message. Uh, Ian, meanwhile, had seen and heard nothing. So I drew a deep breath, and I thought, I owe this to Bill. I'll do it. And I said, Ian, I'm sorry if this sounds strange, but I've just seen Billy. He looked wonderfully happy, and he asked me to give you a message. He asked me to tell you that Lady Juliana of Norwich was absolutely right. Does that mean anything? And Ian moved away from me as if he'd had an electric shock. And he said in a hoarse whisper, you can't have known that. So I know all agog, well, what can't I have known? And then he explained. He had been with Billy in intensive care during the last few minutes of Billy's earthly life. And he said, I wanted to tell him something that would be helpful and encouraging. And he said, I told him the story of Lady Juliana of Norwich, who had been a religious nun back in the 1400s. And she had a vision of heaven. The other nuns were round her, and she looked as if she was going to faint and fall, so they clustered close to her to keep her upright. And then she recovered herself. And the other nuns asked her, Are you all right, uh, Juliana? We thought you were going to fall. You looked as if you were about to faint. And Juliana said, No, it wasn't that. I wasn't ill. She said, But my spirit left my body, and I saw heaven. And, of course, all the other girls said, What is it like? And Juliana said, All shall be well. She was just ecstatic with happiness. <laughs>